Tonight, um, I've asked him to talk about uh, soulish prophecy and just kind of give us some insights into what's the difference between soulish prophecy and prophecy from the Lord. And so, without further ado, your friend in mind, let's give him another Louisiana welcome to John Thomas. <laughs> Yay. Yeah, I, I wouldn't even know where to start to try to rap, actually. Never tried. It's probably a good thing. I have this thing with embarrassing myself. I do enough of it in other ways, and I need to practice something new. Everybody having fun? Yay. Well, this is fun. So you guys come together and learn about hearing from God. That is a good thing. It is uh, one of those subjects that is ever expanding. It's been one of the one of the things I've been studying for, it was about 98 or 1999 when I took John Paul's Art of Hearing God and uh, it kind of started me on this journey of studying the prophetic. And so I've been just kind of searching out different things, reading books and going to different seminars and different equippings. And it's been a lot of fun. One of the things that I, I did in, in uh for a few years as I pastored a church that John Paul had planted up in the Boston area in Massachusetts and pastored that for five and a half years. And it, if you can imagine the kind of church that, that John Paul would plant, we, we had a bunch of people that were there because they were attracted to the prophetic and uh, different levels of prophetic gifting. And so we, we really explored what it meant to, to be a prophetic church. One of the things that we found is that after so long, um, you, you, you have to keep on growing because if you, if you don't continue to grow, the Lord will move you someplace where you will grow. Uh, that there's this thing, if you, if you ever study sheep, and you know, the Lord has decided to call us sheep for, uh, for his purposes, but if you ever study sheep, you, you have to constantly keep them moving because if they keep on eating in the same patch of ground, they will kill that ground to where it cannot grow. And so there, there's, this, there's this growth that we need. We need to continue to grow. We need to continue to be learning new things and continuing to mature in, in our prophetic gifting, in our walk with the Lord. And uh, sooner or later, you, you get to the point where, where you realize that there's more to the prophetic gift than the gift of prophecy. Uh, in the gift of prophecy, we have the, the 1 Corinthians 12, that all may prophesy. But you have other passages that say some are prophets. And so there, there's, a, there's a difference between the gift of prophecy and the ministry of the prophet and, and the office of the prophetic. And learning those differences and learning how the prophetic gift changes through those is, is extremely helpful and ex extremely essential to our ability to grow in our understanding of how the prophetic operates. And one of, those, one of those places of growth really is beginning to understand what the difference between the, the prophetic gift and when it operates through the soul, when it operates through the spirit. But not just that, also when we're reading someone's soul versus hearing from God. And, and a lot of people don't even realize that that's a potential. And so we're, we're going to talk through some of those arenas. Um, we're going to talk through some of those arenas tonight. I had the opportunity a few years ago to be in a roundtable that John Paul put together. Uh, he had grabbed some, uh, some of his friends literally from around the world that were prophetic leaders. And they were talking about the things that were happening in the, in the church and specifically in the prophetic movement. And one of the things that, that came forward was that we're, we're in a season as, as a prophetic movement in the church where if, if some things continue in the direction that they're going in, in the broad prophetic movement, there's actually a growth towards immaturity. And, and, and if things continue to move in that direction, that it's going to be a generation before the Lord begins to release the hunger in young people to pursue the prophetic. And, and one of the key things that they came up with is that we need to begin to understand the difference between soulish prophecy and spirit prophecy and, and put out a protocol for prophetic ministry, which is just a, 
a wonderful paper. I'd encourage you to take a look at it. You can find it on John Paul's website, uh, streamsministries.com. And, and it just goes through some things that, that are extremely helpful and, very, uh, and beneficial for someone that is moving in the prophetic. But one of the things in there is that someone that, that has a healthy prophetic ministry needs to teach on a regular basis the difference between soulish prophetic and, and spirit prophetic. And, and to understand the, the concept of, of how those two work, we're, we're going to back up just a little bit and talk about the difference between the spirit and the soul. Because the, the, the growth of the Christian life, really the maturing in the Christian life, is a maturing in the ability to live out of the spirit versus living out of the soul. And, and we're constantly being put into situations where we're given choices to make that determine whether we're going to choose to live by the spirit or live by the soul. Romans chapter 8 verses 2 through 8 says this, For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do. By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the spirit set their minds on the things of the spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. And the flesh, as Paul's using it here, is, is talking about living out of our, our soulish life. And meaning not just the soul as in what we understand the soul to be the mind, the will, and the emotions. But the soul that has been unbroken and, and, and untrained by the Spirit of God. If you wanted to define the, the soul, like I, I mentioned, the mind, the will, and the emotions is, is commonly what, what is taught. And you can find that. In Augustine's writing in the 4th century, you can find it in the Imitation of Christ by Thomas Akempis in the 13th century. That, that's a common understanding, but when we think of that, because of our educational system, we think of mind, will, and emotions. We have these nice little packets that we put that in, and it, and it kind of separates it from, from the, 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 the meaning that we really should be getting out of it. Y your soul is what you think, what you want, and what you feel. Now, here's the reality. Everybody thinks, wants, and feels. And so even the most mature Christian has a soul. And if you take a look, God has a soul. Talks about things that he thinks, things that he wants, things that he feels. And so our goal is not to get rid of the soul and stop thinking and stop wanting and stop feeling. But to bring the life that the soul has outside of the spirit of God completely to death so that resurrection life can come and the, the new nature that we've been given begins to rise up and cause our soul to be ordered after the things of the Spirit. That, that the guiding force in our life would be the Spirit, not the soul. Now, if you're going to define the Spirit, the, the Spirit is basically the essential core of who we are that it enables us to connect with God. It, it, it's, it's the life force, if, if you will. And, and, and this idea in the spirit, one of the things we have to realize is that we are complete beings, meaning that we are spirit, soul, and body. We will always be spirit, soul, and body. You're never going to cease being a spirit, a soul, and a body. So you, you're, you're not a, a spirit that happens to have a soul and lives in a body. You are a spirit, soul, and body. You will, you will at one point in time shed an earthly body and take on a spiritual body, but you'll never be without a body. And, and you'll never be without a soul, because if you're without a soul, you have no personality. And, and so there, there, there's, we will always have all three of these things. What we need to learn is how to get to the point where it's the spirit that is guiding the soul, receiving virtue from heaven, using that virtue to feed the soul so that the soul can become what it was originally intended to be. And in that place, the body begins to thrive through that connection. 
because when we're in right order, that is the key to, to the fullness of life, the abundant life we've been offered. In this process of the soul coming into submission to the spirit, we, we have a, a theological term that we often use. It's called sanctification. The sanctification is, is talking about this process where the soul begins to change from its old nature, from the way it used to be ordered, the ways that we used to think, the way we used to feel, the things that we used to want, and begin to find new thoughts, new feelings, and new desires. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 and 2 says this, Peter an apostle of Jesus Christ to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, in the sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with his blood. So it's in the sanctification of the Spirit. Titus 3, verses 3 through 8 says it this way, For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, by whom he has poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. The saying is trustworthy, and I want you to insist on these things so that those who believed in God may be careful to devote themselves to good works. These things are excellent and profitable for people. And it's interesting, he says that we, we've been saved by the washing of regeneration and renewal in the Holy Spirit. It's two very different Greek words. They're, they're somewhat related, but they have different meanings that are being used there. The word for rege regeneration literally means to be restored to its original state. I, I, I enjoy cars. One of the things, I really like old cars. The, the word regeneration, it, it's kind of the picture, if you were to take, uh, let, let's say, a, a 68 Mustang, and you were to take it back and give it the original paint job, there's only like four or five colors, I can't remember, four or five colors that they would ever use originally. It has to be one of those colors. All the original parts, the original interior, the original radio, the original speakers, you're not going to have air conditioning, you're not going to have FM, but it, it's going to be exactly the way it was when it came off the factory line. That, that's that word regeneration. That in the spiritual life is talking to getting back to what we lost through the fall, getting back to what Adam had when he had in the garden. But the goal of the life that we've been given through Christ Jesus is not just to get back to the garden. The next word, the washing of regeneration and renewal, the word renewal is a different word. It literally means to change it for the better. So you take that same car, you bore it out, you, you give it a, a 60, 70 more horsepower, you put in some air conditioning so you can drive it all year round, you put in a nice stereo system. It looks like the same car, but it's not the same car. It's much better. It's improved on from where it was. And that's what has happened in, in, this, in this new creation, this new birth, this born-again experience that we've been given when the Spirit of God comes into the human spirit. And like 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17, he who belongs to the Lord is one spirit with him. We actually are, are brought into a union of spirit with the living God and we're given a brand new nature. As you take a look in Romans chapter 8, that, that brand new nature is, is, looks exactly like Jesus looked when he walked on the earth. He had the fullness of the Spirit. He was not lacking in any portion of the Spirit. And so we're not lacking in a portion of the Spirit. We've actually been brought into union with Christ. And that union has given us a new nature, which is why Paul, when talking to the Corinthian church, looked at him and said, why are you acting as if you're just human? Thank you. Because when, once you have received the Spirit of God, you're no longer just human. 
You're, you're something brand new. And Jesus was the very first that showed us this new creation that had never been seen on the earth. We've been given something much better than Adam ever had. Adam walked beside God. God walks inside of us. He doesn't, he never had what we had. There were times of the day when God would come and walk with Adam and he never leaves us and never forsakes us. We've been given something better than what was lost in the garden. And so this process of growing and maturing is actualizing what we've been given. Where we have this, we have been given a, a, a spiritual life force that is brand new, but like all things, it comes in an infant state. There is nothing in creation that's born in its adult state. Things grow. God enjoys the process of growth. And it's this process of agreeing with this growth that is what we call sanctification, which is the ability to begin to cause our soul that is still being energized by anything other than the Spirit of God to come into subjection so that we can live completely ruled by the Spirit of God in our spirit, giving us new life, and we become in, in, in action, in thought, in deed, in feelings and in desires, this new creation that we have become in our spirits. 1 Thessalonians 4 puts it this way, Finally, then, brothers, we ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus, reading verses 1 through 8, that as you have received from us how you ought to walk and to please God, just as you are doing, that you do so more and more. For you know what instructions we gave you through the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, your sanctification. Next time somebody asks you for a prophetic word to know what God wants for them, there's your answer. This is the will of God, your sanctification. That you abstain from sexual immorality. That each one of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor, not in the passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God. That no one trans transgress and wrong his brother in this matter because the Lord is an avenger in all these things. As we told you beforehand and solemnly warned you, for God has not called us for impurity, but in holiness. Therefore, whoever disregards this, disregards not man, but God who gives the Holy Spirit to you. The, the very will of God, the purpose of God and what he's done in releasing a new creation and giving us new life is that we begin to take on his nature and that nature is the Holy Spirit. And the first word there is important. That there's a holiness that comes and that holiness that comes is the separation that allows us to begin to discern what's actually of the spirit and what's of the soul. Because until we are walking in the spirit, we're unable to recognize what's not of the spirit. Because the soul, outside of being in subjection to the spirit, always pretends to be the spirit. It's pretending to, to look like the spirit. And so we begin to think that the things that we want are what God wants. The things that we think are what God thinks. Things that we feel are what God feels and in that place we don't have the ability to discern the source of what we're picking up of what we're hearing now someone that has the spirit of god in them it's going to be very very hard for them to be deceived by a demonic spirit you're going to have to work really hard at rebellion to get to that point where you actually think that a demonic spirit is the spirit of god uh, hopefully you're not going to work that hard at that Right? But what we often miss is the difference between our own soul and the Spirit of God in our spirit speaking to us. And when the soul is unbroken, when the soul is not being brought into submission, what happens is things that God speaks becomes filtered through our soul and we hear what our soul tells us to hear instead of what God says. Let me give you an example. Balaam. Balaam was the only person 
on the earth that was said that he spoke with God face to face other than Moses. And not just a God, but Yahweh God, the one true God. Balaam had encounters with Yahweh God where he spoke to him, where he would get such significant revelation that he would speak curses and blessings over regions and over peoples, and whatever he said would come to pass to such an extent that he had a reputation that reached to other nations. He literally heard from God. He was a true prophet at some point. But Balaam had this issue. Balaam liked being liked. And he liked nice things. He liked the money. And so when he gets his first invitation, come and curse this people. Well, let me go you know, talk to God and see what he says. God, what do you say? Don't go with him. He comes back out, sorry, you know, I, God told me I can't go with you. And so, wait a second, we've got money, you know, we're, sorry, I can only do what God tells me to do. And so they leave. And now they come back with more money and people that are at another level of popularity. You know, it's not just the, the kind of stars, but the real stars, you know, it's not just like your, your regional leaders, it's your international leaders. Now, now it, it's, it's people that, that have more clout. And so now he really, I mean, this thing, he wanted to be liked at one level. And they come, he goes, well, you know, I can only do what God tells me to go. Let me go ask God. Don't go with them. But if you go with them, only say what I tell you to say. Now, got a question. Is God yes and no, or is God yes and yes and no, no? He's yes, yes, and no, no. He's not yes and no. He does not say two opposite things out of both sides of his mouth. Jesus very clearly said, let your yes be yes and your no, no. Anything other than this is from the evil one. So what Balaam is hearing, he thinks is God, is not God. God is still saying, do not go. But his desire for riches and his desires to be seen as gifted and popular and doing what people wants to do causes him to hear what he wants to hear instead of what God is saying, even though God is still speaking. His soul is filtering revelation and causing it to look like the revelation he wants to hear. God told Jeremiah, I think it was Jeremiah, it might have been Ezekiel, he says that people are going to come and inquire of me and I will speak to them according to the idols of their heart. That, that when we have Ezekiel, that we have idols in our heart, we, we have things that we've given over, things that we've decided are important, that we've given ourselves over to these things as a goal for our life, that, that we will hear what we think is revelation that will sound just like the idol that we already had in our heart and it's not God, but God's allowing it to happen. Balaam got to the point where a donkey could tell what was actually going on, and he still couldn't. That, that's what it looks like when soulish issues, strongholds, have their way because a stronghold that's in our life becomes a filter. It's like a lens. If you have colored lenses on, you can look at something white and it looks pink or it looks yellow, or it looks whatever color your colored lenses are, it changes what you see. And you, you could argue all day long that you're seeing what you think that you're seeing, but you're not seeing what's there, you're only seeing what you're seeing. And people that have unbroken soul will argue all day long that they're hearing and having these experiences that they think that they're having, and yet they're not actually hearing or seeing what's actually there they're hearing and seeing what they want to be there because their soul is unbroken. How about this one, Samson? Samson, anointed by God, supernatural strength, knows what it's like when the Spirit of God comes on him. And he got to the point where he didn't even realize that the Spirit of the Lord had left him because he had so given himself over to this stronghold of the affection of a woman. 
that had haunted him his whole life. And because he continued to give himself to it, it got to the point where he couldn't even tell if God was there or not. See, when we leave the issues of our soul unchecked, we miss, we lose spiritual sensitivity. Now, this can happen in church meetings today. How many of you have heard of a guy by the name of John G. Lake? A couple of you heard of John G. Lake. John G. Lake tells a story when he was in, in Washington. He had the healing rooms. There was a number of young men that he mentored during that time. And one of the young men was preaching at a meeting, and he was free that evening. So he went just to, um, just to support his spiritual son. And so he goes to the meeting, and he's there. And this young man gets up, and he preaches, and he preaches this great message. And he calls people up to the front to receive healing and he starts praying for people and he prays for the first person and down they go and he prays for the second person and down they go and the third person he goes through everybody he prayed for just boom hits the ground after the meeting lake is talking with his uh with his disciple and he's like so how, how did the meeting go he goes wow you saw that I mean, the spirit of god was moving it was amazing he was touching all of those people and, and like so well how many of those people did the spirit of god touch he goes, well, all of them, they, they all fell on the ground. He goes, how many of them got healed? All of them? And he started realizing he's not answering the right question. What, what happened is Lake had gone up and interviewed the people as they were getting up off the floor. And this is what he told his disciple. He says, the first 10 got healed. But after that, you got so impressed with your gift that God left, and your gift knocked them down, not God. You see, a, a spiritual gift, an anointing, if you will, is an ability to operate in, in spiritual powers, whether that is to hear in the spirit, to move in the spirit, to heal something, to influence people through the spirit. It, it's, it's a gift. And a gift, the gifts and the callings of God are irrevocable. So your gift will operate whether or not God is using that gift or not. You're, you, you can do stuff. I mean, we, we could tell stories. I have a young man that I spent some time trying to, um, trying to mentor. He is, he, he has a ministry that um, is accepted by a bunch of people in the church where he, he has a website where he will give people prophetic words, pay by prophecy, you can, you know, for so much, he'll, he'll give you an email, a little bit more, he'll give you a phone call. Um, I think it's like $1,000, you can come over to his house for three hours and, and spend some time at the prophet's chamber. Um, he's spoken at, at multiple different churches. And I've watched this young man uh, minister, I was on a couple of, he does uh, phone calls where a bunch of people get on, and, and he, he talks to somebody and tells them, you know, earlier today, you were, you were driving in your car. It was a gray car, and, and you parked on the side of the road, and I can't remember the street names. It was this street. I can see the street signs, and he named the street. It says, and as you were walking down the road, there was a, a car dealership to your right-hand side, and you saw this blue car, and something inside of your heart says, I want that car, and I just want you to let you know that the Lord is saying that he's going to give you that car. Now, everything was true. Now, I, I didn't follow up with the person because, you know, anonymous phone calls. I don't know whether or not the person ever got the call, the car, but detailed, like crazy detailed information. And I, I've had multiple different times where conversations that were had while, while the person was not there, and then he calls up, and, and he starts, you know, starts prophesying, quote, unquote, and says things that had just been said, communication, dreams, you know, one time I, I just got back from Africa. He didn't know I'd been back from Africa, and he was there, and he's like, I see Africa. I see, you know, this, and, and, and it just was, was different things that, that he saw and, and stuff that would come in the future, stuff that was going to happen, and it would happen exactly like he said. This young man doesn't believe that Jesus is God. He doesn't believe that the Bible is accurate. In, in his own words, that, the, that revelation uh, should carry more weight than history, and much of the Bible is just history, and so the words that he says are, are of more value than the Bible. 
uh, he, he's what we would call a psychic. But the problem is enough of the church is caught up with his ministry that he's bringing in fifteen to twenty thousand dollars a month, paid by prophecy, because of the lack of discernment in the church. Now that's a soulish gift. I was actually in a meeting. Me and a another internationally known prophetic person uh, confronted this young man because he'd put up on his website um, a list of different prophetic people and their accuracy rates and himself at the top of the list saying that he was the most accurate prophet in the world and why people should be coming to him. And so we, we were trying to let him know that there was a little bit of pride there that maybe it would be good for him to, to sit down for a period of time and go through some healing and very clear words as to, to the, the wounds of his past, how it got started, what was going on, and they were all accurate. And, and the next day I got probably one of the nastiest emails that I've ever gotten and talking to this person, if I named you would all know, saying basically you need to come to me to learn how to prophesy because you're so inaccurate and I could show you a few things and you're just trying to get me to submit to you and blah, 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 blah. An unbroken soul. Now this one is not necessarily, I mean there's some wants, he, he has this need to be famous, he has this need for people to know him, but it's as much unbroken pain that hasn't been healed. And it's a father wound that has never been dealt with. And so he's prophesying, not prophesying, but we would use that word to look at what he's saying out of the soul. He has great gift, but he doesn't know God. Now, we use the term anointing in a lot of different ways. And just, you, you know, one of the things you, you, you learn pretty quickly is when somebody says anointing, it's usually good to ask them what they mean by it. Because there's so many different ways that that word is used. So when I say anointing, what I mean by the word anointing is the special presence of the Holy Spirit that brings eternal fruit on a gift. And so the gift, we, 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 oh, that person has a great anointing. What we really mean is that person has a great gift. It's an anointing because the word anointing literally means to be smeared with. And so if you're anointed by the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit shows up in the gift and causes the fruit of the Holy Spirit to happen. And we need to learn the difference between those two because too often we get impressed with gift. And just because something is accurate doesn't mean it should be listened to. And we're, we're way too impressed with gifting and supernatural experience. And, and, and this hunger for supernatural experience, it, it's, it's poured out in the whole world. It's why all the paranormal shows are so popular right now. Because when the spirit gets poured out on all flesh, not just believers, it does say all flesh, a hunger for spirit and a desire for spiritual things grows. And so the desire for spiritual things is growing and for, for the shame of the church, if you will, we have bought into a fascination with manifestation instead of a love for truth. And it's caused the discernment in the church to not be able to recognize. Now, in this whole process, whether you, you have a gift that's being operated through the soul or operated through the spirit, there's another aspect that we have to recognize, that there is a natural ability in human beings to read other people's soul. Meaning, you can tell what somebody else is thinking, wanting, or feeling to different levels, different extents, without having any type of spiritual gift at all. It's just a natural ability. How many of you have ever gone into a house and not seen anybody and knew somebody was angry? Because you could just feel anger. Because they're broadcasting anger through their soul and you can pick up what's going on. You, 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 you begin to grow and, and the closer your soul grows to someone else's soul, the more familiar you become with them and you can begin to start ending their sentences. You, you kind of know what they're thinking without them having to say it all. Because there's, there's a growth of the soul. Now that, is, that in and of itself is not an evil thing. Jesus did it. It says again and again, and knowing their thoughts. 
Jesus replied. He just answered the questions that were in their hearts that they hadn't even set or that they had whispered where he couldn't hear. He's reading their minds and he replies. So there's not a problem with just reading someone's soul. The problem comes when we read someone's soul and we call it a prophetic word. And what I've seen in just operating in a bunch of different realms of seeing people prophesy personal prophetic words, probably 50 to 60% of what we call prophetic ministry in most of the church in America is just reading someone's soul. When we begin to realize this, it changes because when we communicate what we're picking up in someone's soul as if it was a word from God, what we do is we begin to establish or strengthen strongholds in other people. Because the stronger the signal, the easier it is to pick it up. And so it's going to be easiest to pick up people's strongholds. Let me give you an example. Lauren Sanford has a book called Purifying the Prophetic. It's an amazingly good book that talks about this ability to read other people's souls and gives you some examples. In one of those, he talks about a young man that was a part of his church. And, and this young man had um, a variety of, of issues from his past that caused him to need to be needed. And he needed other people to rely on him because of those issues from his past. And, and he, he developed this idea that he was supposed to be a pastor, not realizing that the reason he wanted to be a pastor is because he knew that people needed pastors and he just needed to be needed. And so they had spent some time with this young man, been working through some inner healing, working through some past history, and had gotten him to the point where he was realizing what was going on. And they had a guest speaker that came in that was a you know a prophetic minister, somebody that that would be known, and they call this young man out. I just see this, this pastoral call that's on your life and, and, and prophesy over him that he's supposed to be a pastor, and it takes him another six or eight months before they can get this guy to the point where he realizes that that was not true, that this guy was just reading what was on his soul and get him to the point where he's moving forward. The second time, the same thing happens. Somebody else comes in, prophesies over him. I see this calling to be a pastor, and, and you know, you, you're just called to bring healing to people's hearts. And, you know, and, and this whole thing just reads his soul as if it's a word from God. And, and, and finally, the young man just leaves the church because he felt like the church was holding him back from his great calling in God. And now he's languishing, doing absolutely nothing because of soulish prophecy. Because what happened is they, they'd get the stronghold, they'd begin to, to tear it down, and the soulish prophecy would come in and would reestablish the stronghold. That's the problem with soulish prophecy, when we're reading someone's soul and calling it a word from God. Just because something is true in someone's soul does not mean it's what God wants from them. What we need to learn how to do is recognize the difference when we're reading someone's soul versus when we're getting a prophetic word. Because once we begin to recognize that difference, then we respond differently. And instead of saying you're called to be a pastor, you say something like, well, I realize that you have this really strong desire to be a pastor, but God is saying that you're where you're supposed to be at or that you're already on the right path or whatever. You, you take the information and then you take it back to God and ask him what he's saying because most revelation is an invitation from God to engage him for more. And too often we hear the first thing and we run off. God said hi, God had said hi. And he's back there saying, yeah, I was trying to start a conversation, come back. We go off telling people the first thing that we hear when he's trying to engage us and develop relationship. And when we begin to do that, when we begin to pick something up, our first response should begin to engage in prayer with Holy Spirit. Lord, is this what you're saying? Is this what's going on in their life? 
What, what is this? And, and what happens is you begin to grow in your ability to recognize the difference between reading someone's soul and hearing from God. Now, just the fact that you now know that that's possible, you begin to pay attention to it, and you're going to recognize it a lot more than what you did before. But one of the things that you do to begin to grow in this is, is you ask questions. If you want to grow in a spiritual gift, you have to figure out whether or not you're accurate. And too many times we, we, we don't like our words being judged. And it creates an issue in our growth because you can't mature unless somebody tells you that you're wrong. And so one of the best things you do is ask questions. Hey, I, I'm picking up this. Is that something you've been thinking about? Yeah, I've been thinking about that for a couple of days. Oh, cool. Well, let's ask God what he says about that. You just realize I'm just picking up what's already going on in their soul. This may or may not be God. Maybe God's saying, well, that's exactly, I'm prompting that thought in them, and this is what I'm saying. Or maybe he's saying that they're dwelling on that because of this. But you start that conversation, but it usually it starts with asking questions. And so you begin to feel a lot. You begin to realize how that works. Now, one of the things that's key in recognizing soulish prophecy is usually, recognizing reading someone's soul, is usually when you read someone's soul, you read their soul in your soul. Meaning this, that you're, you're picking up what somebody else is thinking because a thought is going through your head. You're picking up what somebody else is feeling because you have a feeling in your heart. You're picking up what somebody else is wanting because you begin to want. You can feel that want. And so you recognize it usually will come in that way. It's pretty rare to have an angel stand in front of someone and tell you this, 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 and this if it's just what's going on in their soul. They would, they would have a different perspective. They would have heaven's perspective. They wouldn't just tell you what's going on in their soul. They would, they would possibly start there and then add something else. And so the different levels of revelation are a clue as to what you're probably picking up. Now, again, if you press into this understanding of the still small voice and being able to pay attention to your thoughts and how your thoughts get moved by things outside of you, not every thought that you have is your own thought, as you pay attention to that, those thoughts get louder and louder and louder, and it becomes easier and easier to recognize when you're not that your thoughts and so it can sound like a voice in your head when it's somebody else's thoughts because you've given yourself to that. Learn to recognize the difference between thoughts that you're picking up because they're broadcast versus the voice of God speaking in your thoughts. It's a, very, it, it, it's a clear difference, but it's not clear at first. Because like anything else, we start at, at an immature state, like we talked about earlier, and we begin to grow. You know, you, you have to learn to walk, but walking is just controlled falling. <laughs> right? You pick one foot up, you throw yourself off balance, you begin to fall forward, you catch yourself, and it's the falling that propels you forward. It's learning how to control the falling that propels you forward. It's not learning how not to fall. As we begin to realize this, this helps us to grow much faster. Because the number one thing that hinders people from learning how to walk is the fear of falling. And it's the only thing that gets you to move forward. When you begin to deal with that fear and you begin to be okay with that, you learn to put yourself in safe situations. You ask questions. It's one of the reasons why so many people say, don't say, thus saith the Lord. Because what you're picking up may or may not be, thus saith the Lord. Now, if you hear an audible voice, you can say, I just heard an audible voice say, blah, 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 blah. But if it comes in other ways, you need to just communicate what it is. You know, I just keep on getting this thought. Does that make any sense to you? Yeah, I've been thinking about that. Oh, interesting. Well, I wonder why I'm picking that up. Let's, let's pray about that. And you begin to pray, and you begin to learn as, as the Holy Spirit trains you, you begin to recognize how he guides you because you'll begin to be trained in a way that's different than anybody else because you are unique. You're not like everybody else. 
but it's through that interaction that you begin to learn. So put yourself in a place where you get instant feedback whenever you can. And whenever someone becomes afraid of feedback, be afraid of their quote-unquote revelation because they're unsafe. Now, that, I'm telling you that because you need to know that because if you ever get to the point where you think that what you heard is definitely God and there's no way that it couldn't be and there's no possible way that you could be deceived, you're already deceived. Now, you can be absolutely confident that God is speaking and still be humble and someone tell you that he's not and, and you genuinely find out whether or not you were or whether or not you want, you're not. So if you can't hear feedback, you're, you're already in a dangerous place. One of the other ways to recognize whether yourself or someone has a developed sense of reading someone's soul or is consistently hearing from God is by looking at the fruit of the ministry. What happens in the lives of those that are being ministered to? What's going on in the life of the one being ministered? Now, th this is one of the ways that you begin to tell the difference between somebody that's just immature in the prophetic. And, and you can read someone's soul just out of immaturity and not realize that you're reading someone's soul because you, you've got to grow in that ability. Hebrews 5.14 says, Those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern good and evil. So we, we actually grow in our ability to discern by practice. And there's some things that you're, you're just not going to hear somebody teach you well enough that you're going to know for certain from that point on. You've got to put it into practice. It's in the doing that you grow. right? But, and there's a place where, where, where it's just immaturity. But there's a place where someone has so developed that ability that they've become a psychic, whether or not they call themselves Christian. And, and when you find Christian psychics, you, 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 you learn to recognize them by their fruit. Now, we, we often call them false prophets. Is that, that's what they are. And here, here's a couple things that helps you to dis discern that. One, look for the fruit. Galatians 5.22, the fruit of the Spirit is love. Joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Is the person self-controlled? Is the person patient? Are they joyful? Are they kind? Are they good? Are they gentle? Are, are, are they faithful with their commitments? If, if you can't find those things in their life, they may or may not have a big gift, but gift means absolutely nothing because gift is free. Who cares? Satan's got a big gift. The question is, are you loving? Because that's what's impressive in heaven. And that's what's supposed to impress the church. You, gotta look, you, you look in, in the person's life. Now, we're not doing this because, and I'll, I'll, I'll touch this again, because we're trying to, to find a way to, to default someone or not pay attention to someone. But if, if someone is, is somebody that's speaking into your life, you need to figure out whether or not you want them to speak into your life. This, so this is the way. So this, this isn't going around and trying to find anybody that you have no relationship with and you don't know to, to you can warn everybody else. The last thing that the kingdom needs are, is more watchdogs. He calls for watchmen, not watchdogs. All right, so we, we need people that, that are, we need to be looking for our, for our own self. So if somebody's going to be sowing into you, if someone's going to be speaking to your life, giving you guidance, giving you counsel, you've got to look for fruit, but you've also got to look at your own life. Am I growing in love? Am I growing in joy and peace and patience and goodness and kindness and faithfulness? And then you look at the, at the results of those that are, are most ministered to. Because when someone has a, a big gift, good or bad, people get drawn to them. Take a look at the people that get drawn to them. How is their life? Is their life getting better or is their life getting worse? I had a friend of mine that was a pastor up in 
New Hampshire, and he said this, you know, it's not a bad thing if your church attracts fruits and nuts. It's just really bad if you're producing them. <laughs> right? Hopefully we're attracting people that actually need help. Because if you only attract people that don't need help, there's an issue there. But if people aren't being helped, there's also an issue there. So what's the results of the ministry? The second way that you discern is, is by the Spirit. 2 Corinthians 5.16 says, From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ to the, according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. And too many people ha have trained themselves to recognize gifting and not recognize rank. And there's a big difference between gifting and rank in the kingdom. There, there are people that have great rank, that have great authority to use another realm. Paul talks about the sphere of his rule, that he had a level of authority that reached to certain things and didn't reach to others. We need to learn to recognize people by the spirit and recognize authority by the spirit so that we're not too impressed by gifting because gifting can be smaller with greater authority and accomplish more. And you can have very little authority in the kingdom and have great gift. 1 Corinthians 2, 10 through 12 says, These things God has revealed to us through the Spirit, for the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except the spirit of that person which is in him? So also no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. Now, we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given us by God. Now, for us to be able to trust what we're picking up by the spirit, our own discernment has to be cleansed first. Because if you've got strongholds in your own life, you could be offended at something and, and it not be discernment at all. So, you, 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 you know, there's a process of growing in your own ability, in your own sanctification, but there's also a process where we have to learn to recognize by the Spirit. And so we don't wait until we get everything together before we grow. We, we, we grow in all areas simultaneously, hopefully, as we move forward. Here's the next thing. You look at the content of the message. Um, the, the overall message, not necessarily the specific message that's given in a moment, but what's the overall message that they communicate with their life? Are they exalting Christ or are they exalting their own ministry? Do they, do they spend all of their time only talking about their spiritual experiences? Or are they talking about Jesus? Because someone that only talks about all their spiritual experiences is probably has an overexalted sense of their own gifting. And when someone has an over-exalted sense of their own gifting, you can't trust their ability to put importance on anything. Because what will happen is when they've got an over-exalted sense of their own gifting, they will try to puff you up to think that you're special so that your feeling of being special is tied to their revelation so that you think that they're special. And when that, well, I'll just leave that one alone. You guys understand. That's dangerous. Paul says this to the Corinthian church, for I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Are they constantly leading you to Jesus? Or do you leave feeling like you need another word from them to be able to get to the next place? I, I read an interesting article not too long ago uh, about, um, a, about a thing that's been happening with psychics where, where psychics will give someone um, some revelation for free and they'll give them just enough that they want more and then they'll, con then, then they'll tell them, they, they usually tell them that there's something that's wrong that they need their help with and they keep on giving them just a little bit more and start getting paid more and more and more and more and more and the person never actually gets better, but they, they're constantly spending more money. And it's, it's actually a fraudulent thing, but it's so common. The reality is that stuff happens in the church too. We don't always pay with money. Sometimes we just pay with praise. 
sometimes we pay with money. But watch, watch that thing. If, if, if you feel like you need someone's gift, or if someone communicates that anybody needs their gift, run. You don't need anybody's gift. You need Jesus Christ. Power. Is something actually happening? You know, Paul basically says in, in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and in other places, in 2 Corinthians, that if there's no power in a ministry, it's not from God. So is there actually something happening? Does God show up? Because it, it may be accurate, it may be information, but there's no actual power, there's no actual presence. And, and when that's happening, you, you realize that there's an issue. Now, just because there's power doesn't mean that it's really God, because there, there is demonic power um, that happens. But if there is no power, it's not God. Practice and experience. Hebrews 5.14, I mentioned earlier. The solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. And then from scripture, here's one of the keys. If you expect to be able to recognize the voice of God, the only way you can train your ears to that voice is by constantly being in scripture. If you don't know the content of the scripture, you cannot trust yourself to discern what you're hearing is from God or not from God. Because that's what he's given us to know what his voice sounds like. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12 says, The word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. One of the best ways to grow in your ability to discern it is through constantly being in the word of God, learning, memorizing scripture, making it the meditation of your heart because it begins to order your heart according to the things of the spirit. And what happens is it actually gives you language for prophetic words. And you'll find yourself thinking of scriptural principles and scriptural thoughts in prophetic words. Now, one of the things that has to be said, and I kind of touched on this earlier, but when it comes to discernment, there's a big difference between using discernment and, and being judgmental. The gift of discernment is not the gift of suspicion, right? And it's not the gift of criticism. It, 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 it's, it's, to, it's to give wisdom and to be loving, not to tear someone down. So, so you have to look at your heart attitude. Are you looking for an excuse not to believe, or are you genuinely looking for God? Because whatever, whatever you're looking for, you'll find. So if you're looking for the bad in people, you're going to find it. If you're looking to see if God is in something, then if he's there, you'll find it. Even if it comes in a package that you don't like. Because one, one, of the, one of the fun things about God is he's more after your heart than anything else. And so he will constantly come to you in packages that you don't like so that he can deal with issues of your heart that he doesn't like. And so you, you, you've got to have that hard attitude of looking for God however he comes, and then you'll find him when he does come. And the other thing is, 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 is in this judging, we're, we're judging activity versus a person. And if somebody says, you're, you're not supposed to judge. Well, let's take a look at 1 Corinthians 2, 14 through 16. The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they're folly to him, and he's not able to understand them because they're spiritually discerned. The spiritual person judges all things. So if we're wanting to be spiritual people, we need to learn the right way to judge all things. But is himself to be judged by no one, for who has understood the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him. But we have the mind of Christ. Now, here, here's the difference. It's the type of judging that's done by the jury, not the type of judging that's done by the judge. The jury decides whether or not an action happened. The judge determines what the cost 
what the discipline is. We are the jury. We decide whether or not an action is right or wrong. And we are required to do that scripturally. But we are not the judge. We have no right to decide what that person deserves because of the action that was done. Luke chapter 6, verses 43 and 45 says, For no good tree bears bad fruit, nor again does a bad tree bear good fruit, for each tree is known by its own fruit. For figs are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor are grapes picked from a bramble bush. The good person out of the good treasure of his heart produces good. The evil person out of his evil treasure produces evil, for out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks. So we are fruit judges. We're not people judges. We cannot be afraid to look at people that are looking to minister to us or, or to speak into our lives and look for fruit. Look for the content of their message. Look whether or not they're, they're accurate. You know, somebody that keeps on saying that they hear from God and nothing that they ever say comes true, sooner or later you've got to realize they're not hearing from God. And is there maturity? Is there a maturity in their own life? Is there integrity in their life? Now, what's the difference between someone that is just giving a soulish prophecy and a false prophet? The question is not an issue of accuracy, but the issue of apostasy. So immaturity can cause soulish prophecy like we already said. But the line is drawn when someone tries to lead us away from Christ, whether it be to themselves or to anything else. 2 Corinthians 11 says this, For I, ve I feel a divine jealousy for you, since I betrothed you to one husband to present you as a pure virgin to Christ. But I'm afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. For if someone comes and proclaims another Jesus than the one we proclaim, or if you receive a different spirit from the one you received, or if you accept a different gospel from the one you accepted, you put up with it readily enough. The Second Corinthians is a wonderful chapter I would encourage you to read because it's basically Paul teaching the church how to discern true apostolic ministry from false apostolic ministry. And there's just so many good lessons about discernment that is in that book. It's extremely helpful. But that, that's, we, we, need to, we need to grow in discernment. And one of the things that happens, let, let's take a look at Deuteronomy 13. Because there's two passages in Deuteronomy that, that sometimes get talked about when we start talking about missing prophetic words. Because there's this concept that, that is sometimes communicated, like you've always got to get it right, or you're missing it. And, and the reality is, is we, we need to actually have that based upon Scripture, because if the Scripture says that, then we've got to accept it, whether or not we like it or our experience fits with it. So let, let's take a look at the actual verses where this is talked about. The first is Deuteronomy 13, verses 1 through 5. It says, if a prophet or a dreamer of dreams arises among you and gives you a sign or a wonder, and the sign or wonder that he tells you comes to pass, and if he says, let us go after other gods which you have not known and let us serve them, you shall not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams. Now notice, they're accurate. What they said happens. This is going to happen five days from now. This is going to happen ten days from now or five months from now, five years, whatever. They say it's going to happen, and it happens. There's real power. There's real accuracy. But they lead you to anything other than Jesus Christ. You shall not listen to them. You don't even listen to, to find the accurate words so that you can learn how to discern for yourself. You just do not pay attention to that person period, if you find that they're leading you to anything other than the Lord. Why? It continues, for the Lord your God is testing you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. Do you need, quote unquote, revelation or do you need God? Because prophecy is not your next horoscope. 
Now, if it's drawing you closer to Jesus, then it's a good thing. But if it's telling you what to do tomorrow because you're not willing to pay the price to have your own relationship with Jesus, it's evil. You shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him and keep his commandments and obey his voice. And you shall serve him and hold fast to him. But that prophet or that dreamer of dreams shall be put to death because he's taught rebellion against the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt and redeemed you out of the house of slavery to make you leave the way in which the Lord your God commanded you to walk so you shall purge the evil from your midst. So again, the issue is accuracy is not accuracy. The issue is apostasy. Now, modern day church, they don't let us kill people anymore. So when it says that prophet shall be put to death, in modern terminology, that, that's you have nothing to do with them. You don't talk to them. That's 1 Corinthians, I think it's 1 Corinthians chapter 6. You put them out and, and you don't even eat with such a person. You cut off all fellowship. You don't hang around to be nice, you cut off all fellowship. If they're going to lead you to another God, you got to get rid of the poison. Now, what is this? Well, actually, let me skip that section. The fruit is what's important. Let's look at the next passage, which is Deuteronomy chapter 18, which is the next one which talks about Killing prophets. So we, we need, because this is the one that talks about, you know, hey, if, if they miss it, you got to kill them. So let's take a look at what it actually says. Deuteronomy chapter 18, and we're going to start in verse 15. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers. It is to him you shall listen, just as you desired of the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly when you said, let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God or see this great fire anymore lest I die. And the Lord said to me, they are right in what they have spoken. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers. And I will put my words in his mouth and he shall speak to them all that I command him. And whoever will not listen to my words that he shall speak in my name, I myself will require it of him. But the prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name that I have not commanded him to speak, or who speaks in the name of other gods, that same prophet shall die. If you say in your heart, how may we know the word that the Lord has not spoken? When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the word does not come to pass or come true, that is a word that the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken it presumptuously. You need not be afraid of him. Now, did you notice a change from the first time to the second time? That prophet shall die the second time. You need not be afraid of him. And, and here's the issue. There, there's a, a gentleman by the name of Wayne Grudem who is a theologian. He was actually one of the translators of the ESV version of the Bible. Uh, he wrote a book called The Gift of Prophecy, which is a very heady book um, that goes through, it's a theological treatise on the gift of prophecy in scripture. And he takes a look at this scripture. The, the Hebrew word that is, is translated in here, but the prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name that I have not commanded him to speak, or who speaks in the name of other gods, that same prophet shall die. That word or in the Hebrew is an article that could be translated as or, or and, depending on the context, and the translator needs to make the choice as to which one fits. And so most translators have translated that as or, but he argues that it would be better for it to be translated as and because of the very next phrase. Because if, if you read it that way, the, per, the prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name that I have not commanded him to speak and who speaks in the name of other gods that same prophet shall die. Now that fits in with Deuteronomy 13. If they're leading you to other gods, the, 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 the answer is death. And so it's getting it wrong and leading you to other gods. The answer is death. And then he continues, how are you going to know? Well, it doesn't come to pass. But if someone just speaks a word and it doesn't come to pass, but he doesn't lead you to other gods, then you just don't listen to him. Which is how they, they finish the, pack, the, the, the verse. And so that, that, that understanding 
is, is very, very helpful because, the, you know, we have to be biblical if we're going to actually think that what we're doing is appropriate. And so that, that understanding is key there because it's not about that. And one of the, one of the ways you look is how did the Israelites respond to, to untrue or missed prophecies? And, and you look through, I mean, take a look at David, who was um, pretty jealous for the word of the Lord, for, for the name of the Lord. He, he had two prophets that he kept on staff. He had a prophet and a seer that he had on staff in his uh, court. He had Nathan the prophet and Iddo the seer. And Nathan the prophet comes to him, and the job of the prophet, now he had other people that were advisors. He had Ahithophel and others that were just advisors. If he just needed wisdom or counsel, he went to them. But when he wanted to find out if something was the word of the Lord and what God was saying, he'd go to the prophet. And so he goes to Nathan. He says, it's been in my heart to build a house for the Lord. And Nathan invokes the name of the Lord. What's in your heart is good. The Lord is with you. Do all that's in your heart. And Nathan leaves. God shows up that night, speaks to Nathan. Hey, you missed it. Go back and apologize. Tell him he's not building that house. His son will build that house. Nathan goes back and says, hey, by the way, yesterday, sorry about that. You know, the Lord actually says you're not going to build the house. Change of plans here. David not only doesn't kill him, he doesn't even fire him. Why? Because he was genuinely searching for the word of the Lord. He admitted his mistake. And, and he moved on. So, so David obviously didn't think that this passage was saying kill him because the response was just, okay, you made a mistake. Let's move on. You take a look at Nehemiah. He has false prophets, people that are actually being paid to make up prophecies that, that, that they didn't even think God that said, had said to them. But people that were quote-unquote prophets and Nehemiah just turns to the Lord, which he was the governor. He was the one that would have had the right to kill someone if he would have felt like that was appropriate. And, and, and Ezra was already back in the land, and so they had already been told and given permission to live according to the law. That he, Ezra came back to teach them how to live according to the law. And, and so when this happens, Nehemiah just says, Lord, remember them. He just turns them over to the Lord. He doesn't deal with them according to that way. And so... The, the people in the Old Testament didn't think that that scripture meant that way, meant that if you just miss it, that you're supposed to die. So we don't have to think that that's what that means. Does that make sense? Now, I'm, I'm not saying that because I'm afraid any of you actually think that, but it's helpful to have a biblical basis for that so that if somebody says, well, what about Deuteronomy 18? You can actually have, have, have a real answer for them. And you could take a look in the New Testament. If we considered anybody that missed it as someone that we don't want to listen to ever again, we wouldn't have most of the New Testament because in Acts, Paul misses some words. He gets on the boat and he says, hey, you can't go on this journey because I perceive, and that word perceive, it's the same word that's used of visions. I perceive that this journey is going to end in the loss of cargo and of life. And then in the midst of everything going on, he comes back and says, well, an angel stood in front of me. Higher level revelation. He misinterpreted the lower level of revelation, so God comes with higher level revelation and clarifies, you're actually, nobody's going to die, you're just going to lose cargo. Yeah, you thought it was going to be bad, and he, maybe he even sensed that people were going to be in the ocean, and he just assumed that they were going to die. He gets the clarity, he clarifies the word, and we still let him write the Bible. Right, Agabus. Agabus shows up in a meeting and, and grabs Paul's belt and ties his hands up to it. In this way, the, 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 the Jews are going to bind the hands of the owner of this belt and turn him over to the Gentiles, turn him over to the Romans. Wrong. Now, Jews were involved, Romans were involved, binding was involved, but the Jews didn't bind Paul, they were trying to kill Paul. They didn't turn him over to the Romans. The Romans saved Paul's life. He, he got it kind of right, but he got it wrong. And everybody that was around completely misapplied it because they're all like, don't go to Jerusalem, don't go to Jerusalem. And Paul's like, wait a second. The Spirit's already put it in my heart to go to Jerusalem. Your prophetic word is not going to change what God said to me. Now that's a clue for some people right there. 
we actually have to hear the voice of the Lord for ourselves first so that we know how to respond. Does that make sense? Now, any questions? Because I know we just covered a lot of material. Does a soulish word have a different feeling than a spirit word? Yes, it does. But you have to learn how to recognize the difference of the feeling. And that's part of the Hebrews 5.14. It's by reason of use. But, but they, they really, really do. And, and the, the thing is, the way that your prophetic gift operates is going to change the way that that feeling is. So for me, um, I, I, would, I would use the terms life. Like when I hear a soulish word, it just... It doesn't have any life to it. it, it it's, it's like there's no vibrancy. It, it's just kind of hollow. And it, that's, that's how I would describe the feeling. And it's not a sound. It, it's just the way that it feels. And, and so I, I, I can recognize it that way. And then that's how my gift works. Now, other people, I mean, I've got a friend of mine that when people pray or prophesy, he sees colors coming out of their mouth. And so he just recognizes whether they're good colors or bad colors. And I mean, that, that's kind of nice. I like that. I've never had that, but I'd take it, you know. Um, yeah, that, that, that's a good one. Um, one. One of the things that I found very, very helpful in, in discerning the difference is, is I've listened to a bunch of dreams. Because we, we talk about in dream interpretation, one of the things we talk about is entering into the dream, where you dream the dream of the dreamer as they're telling you the dream. And, and in a dream, it's... It, it, especially when it's not your own dream, it's pretty easy to feel whether or not it's a soulless dream or a spirit dream. And that teaches you how your spirit responds to soulish revelation. And then it becomes easier to recognize it when it comes in other forms. So that can be helpful. So I saw a hand back here and then we'll come up here. Yeah, so what responsibility does the person that gives a soulish prophecy have to go back and correct that? Well, any time you find out that a word that you said was from God is not from God, you're responsible to go back to whoever heard you communicate that word and respond. So if you were on national TV, you need to find a way to get back on national TV and apologize for missing the word. If you were talking to a group of friends, then you go back and make sure the group of friends, if it was an individual or if it was in front of the church. Um, so so that, that's the responsibility. Anytime that you're inaccurate, if you want to have integrity and, and the spirit of truth, the truth and integrity are related concepts. If you want the spirit of truth to witness to your words, you have to have integrity. And so if you cover over the fact that you missed it, so that people will believe you, you actually steal faith instead of give faith, and the spirit of truth won't put faith in the hearts of the hearers, and you'll find people not listening when you're accurate simply because you refuse to admit it when you weren't. Right. Yeah, if you give a word part of its spirit, but then you add on to it, you, you, you want to acknowledge that as soon as you find out, as soon as you recognize that. Whether the Lord tells you or whether the person comes back and says, well, this happened, but this never happened. And, you know, however it is, then you, you just apologize at, at that level. Yeah, yeah, God doesn't need hamburger helper. Um, and, and too often we're, we're trying to convince people that we have revelation and so we puff it up to make it seem like more. And, 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 and the problem is it's usually actually the shorter words that have more impact. I mean, I've gotten a lot of prophetic words in my life. The most impactful prophetic word I've ever gotten in my life was just one, one sentence. John Thomas, you are a son. Now that sounds pretty... I mean, you could say that to anybody, and it would be accurate, but that word left me in a heap and changed my life because it was what God was saying in the moment. 
Now, if the person would have tried to expand on it, it, and it ends up stealing the, the impact. And, and so, yeah, we, we need to learn how to give what we give. And we need to learn the difference between interpreting metaphor and explaining prophecy. Too many times we try to explain something that, that God is saying, and it's not a metaphor that needs interpreted. It's us trying to justify what was being said. And that's, there's a big difference between those two that, that's needed to be learned. Yeah. Yes. Here, let's make this. Oh, okay. I had a friend once that she was sick. She had a disease, a lung disease. And she had a codependence problem with her family. You know, there was a, well, anyway, she had a dream about all this, you know, something anyway. And she asked me if I knew what it meant. So I said, well, let me go pray about it. Because at the time, really, I had been asking God to help me interpret my own dreams or my family, you know. And this was going beyond that. It was a, a friend, you know. And so when I I prayed about it, and I come back, and I told her what I thought it meant. And it was just, like, seemed so simple. Like, it, it wasn't hard to even see that. And, but then it was like when she told me the dream, every detail of that dream is like it became as though I had the dream. I remembered it like it was my dream. Right. And then all that that dream spoke did happen. And it was for, it was not all good, but yet it was. I mean, she got saved before she died from this disease. But her, her family needed to prepare for her leaving. And that's what the dream was about, telling her family to prepare for her, you know. And it doesn't sound like a good dream, but really it comforted her and me to know that God would give that. You know, and, and people don't want to hear that. A lot of time. How do you handle you know, that just happened to work like that. But I get a lot of warnings. Yeah, so how do you handle that? You, you let them handle it. You deliver the message. They deal with the response. Now, here's the thing. You only deliver the message when God says you're supposed to deliver the message. Just because you have revelation doesn't mean you're supposed to say it. And you don't deliver a negative word that you like, ever. Because, well, yeah, because, oh, something bad's going to happen. Oh, and they deserve it. I'm going to let them know. Now, be because of this, that's one of the clues, that's one of the clues that you know that there's the soul involved. Your soul is involved in that. Um, and, and here's the other clue. One, one of the easiest ways to recognize soulish revelation is this. I knew it. I thought that's what was going on. Now, you could have a dream, you can have an angel speaking to you, it doesn't matter. If it fits something that you already thought, already believed, especially if it's in a negative context, it's probably soulish. Because the other side of the soulish is not just picking up, when we talked about the two different realms of soulish prophecy, it's not just picking up what's in somebody else's soul, but your own soul speaking, sounding like the spirit. And, and usually when that's going on, I mean, the most common one is, um, I'm going to marry so-and-so. You know, or, or I saw myself on the stage with a mic and everybody thought it was great. You know, usually those, those are the types of, of, those are the most common soul, soul dreams. They're, they're just, there's stuff that we've already wanted, already thought about. If we've thought it, wanted it, and felt it before it's familiar to us, it's probably a familiar spirit that doesn't necessarily could be a familiar soul or even a familiar spirit is coming and speaking. Does, does that make sense? Yeah. Any questions over here? Yeah, in the back. Are there psychics? Well, yeah, there's definitely psychics. Because the gifts and the callings of God are irrevocable. And, and so there are people, I mean, Balaam started out good with a good gift. He was talking to God, and he ended up a psychic. But you also have Jannies and Jambres that never started out good, that was operating in real gift, demonically inspired, demonically 
energized. It was very real. And Jesus says very clearly in Matthew chapter 7 that they're going to be Christian psychics. They will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, didn't we not prophesy in your name? Didn't we cast out demons in your name and do these mighty wonders in your name? And I'm going to say to, you, to them, get away from me. I never knew you, you workers of lawlessness. And that word lawlessness is interesting. It literally means ones who think there's no standard of conduct. Yeah, and, but the personal gain can look a lot of, of different ways. It could be the praise that they've always wanted. It could be someone needing them that they've always wanted. It could be money. It could be popularity. It could be just the sense of, of being powerful. Um, so there's, there's a want to. Because you, you really, it, and if you have the spirit of God, you cannot be deceived unless you have a want to. You have to have something in agreement with the deception for the deception to have a, a, a hook. Um, now, somebody outside of the spirit of God, um, I mean, their, their want to could just be the, the curiosity of the known, right? But there, there's something there that they're getting out of, out of, out of it. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay. I scared everybody. <laughs> Yay. Okay. L l let me, I'm just going to mention something real quick as, as we're wrapping up. I, I, I've got some resources in the back that I brought because I think they might be helpful. One of them, I, I only have a few of them left, is, is the book that I helped John Paul write on The Art of Praying the Scriptures, um, which goes through the, the process of Lectio Divina, which is divine listening, how you engage the scriptures for revelation and encounters. Um, I think you'll find it helpful as teaching and then a devotional that's in the back of it. Um, and the other ones, I've got a couple teachings. I've got one that's on the Father's heart um, that has a Father's blessing. I have one that's on that. I started talking a little bit about Christ in you, the hope of glory. That he who belongs to the Lord is one spirit with him. I just explore that in depth. Um, I have a DVD on compassion and, and how compassion is a key to power. But the one I, I want to kind of let you guys know about is this one doxological theology because what I do in here is I talk about how the word and the spirit operate together and how prophetic experiences help us to understand the Bible and the Bible helps us to understand prophetic experiences and how there's always got to be a unity between them for us to believe the prophetic experiences and I talk about some interesting encounters and just how they reveal truth and how God uses revelation to expand our knowledge of truth. So I think some of you will, will find it helpful. Um, so those are in the back. Thank you so much, John. Let's, let's give him a hand. I'd like to take up a, um, a love offering um, for John. And um, if, you, if you want to uh, make out a, a check, make it out to Christian Center, and we will give him everything. Um, um, I've, I have the, uh, the book now. I'm going to tell you, you can, you're going to have to fight for that book because I think there's only five of them over there, um, and they don't have any more because they sold out of them from another uh, conference. So, um, um, so thank you again, John, for coming. Um, it's always healthy to um, really say, you know, that's one of the reasons why we, we do a lot of stuff here where, we want you to understand your inner working with inner healing and things like that. Because uh, the more you know your own opinions that are not necessarily the Lord, they're just your opinions, the, and the more you understand where things have kind of hit, it, it cleanses that filter to where you can trust when, when, uh, when stuff starts to flow. And, uh, and it also helps you identify when somebody else... Uh, is giving you something, and uh, man, there's a lot of good stuff uh, there tonight, so um, I'm going to just pray real fast, we'll dismiss, and we'll just, um, if we could just pass this, pass this around, and uh, just pass it down the deal here, I'll get this other one, pass it for the other side here, and uh, well, this one's got a 
This one's got a quarter already in it. Yeah, no. Yeah. <laughs> we'll put a thing over it, and uh, we'll just pray, and we will get out of here. I don't know if we want to get out of here. Let's see. Yes. I don't. Did we tape this tonight? No, we didn't tape it. It was on the internet. I mean, it's. I mean, it was not on the internet. It was on the live stream. I think we're still on the live stream. Yes. Question. Is there a copy of the notes? <laughs> yes. Okay. There you go. Um, it, th- what John what John taught today was actually a portion of a course that he's developed called Practical Prophetic, right? Practical Prophetic, and it's um, on streams. Uh, dot com. You can you can stream. You can purchase the manual, or is the, are the notes online? Who would want to come up and explain it? So it's actually it's an online course, and so it's got all the videos, and you can choose to either download the notes or get a manual mailed to you uh, with the notes. But it has, I think, there's like 17 hours worth of video, and it has this material. I talk about the difference between the, the gift of prophecy, the ministry of the prophetic, the office of the prophet, how the functions of the prophetic changes in each of those and some of the ways to grow in each of those. I talk about the fivefold, how it operates with the prophetic, and how each of the different fivefold brings something that adds to the prophetic and challenges a weakness in the prophetic, and how the prophetic challenges that. I talk about emotionally healthy prophetic. Um, so there, there's a variety of things that are in there that, that'll be helpful. Streamsministries.com. Uh, Streams Ministries. If you type in uh, John Thomas or John Paul Jackson. Yeah, and the other, the other thing, on the back, we have just little cards that have my website and, and Facebook, Twitter information. So you can go to my website. There's links on there. And uh, actually, I've got some free podcasts that you can download. One of them is, is specifically about the prophetic. And um, so you got some free resources and some, some teaching. Uh, one of the one of the blogs is about the how to use the scripture to discern prophetic experiences and the importance of that. So there's there's some free resources on that website. The cards back there. It's just lifeempowerment.com. But if you want the cards, they're they're also back there. And he's got the cards you can like scan with your phone, which I I saw earlier today. I thought that was pretty cool. You can just. <laughs> All right. It feels like we need to do some kind of activation here tonight um, a little bit. So why don't we, um, do you have any any exercises you like to do? Okay. Come on up here. Why don't we just, why don't we, I want to do one exercise. We do, we traditionally do like to do an exercise and everything because this is about learning, right? And uh, so now we get to, get to practice. So I'll turn it back over to you. Okay. Let's. Let's do this. Um, we're we're going to start with a couple at a time, just, just to make it interesting. So I need a volunteer to come right up here. Stand right here in front of me. There you go, Lord. Come on up. Right up. Awesome. <laughs> okay. Now, no, stand right here facing me. Okay. And what I want you to do, it, you're going to keep your eyes closed. I'm going to have somebody come up and stand behind you. I'm going to tell you when they're behind you and have you say whatever the Lord gives you as they're standing behind you. Okay? So keep your eyes closed. Okay. Somebody behind you now. Uh, I felt like I heard the word wisdom. Anything else, or am I supposed to add to it? Or? <laughs> I just feel like this person has a beautiful smile and that God really loves the way this person smiles. I 
Thank you, Faith. Yeah. Yes, I have a feeling who it might be. Um, Kim Akes. No, it's good. You, you've got to step out and try. That's, that's the whole thing. You, you don't grow unless there's a risk. There's a risk. Okay, so now what we're going to do is I did, you, I did that as an example because you, you saw the, the three things that I want you to do because we're, we're going to get into groups and, and have you practice this. I'll explain the groups in a second. The three things, revelation. And once you're done with the first thing, ask, is there more? Okay? And then ask, is, it, are, are, is this person male or female? And say it out loud. And then who you think it is. All right? And if you genuinely have no concept of who it is, make somebody up. Because your maker-upper is right next to your revelator. And sometimes you have to think that you're making something up to give yourself permission to step into a realm of revelation that you're not comfortable with. When you're practicing, it's okay to do that. And we're in a safe place to practice. So what we're going to do is we're going to get into groups of four or five people. Definitely, well, actually, let's do groups of four people. So if we can avoid groups of five, that would be great. But let's try not to do groups of, four, of three because it's too small. So groups of four people, and if once we're done, we'll get into groups of five. You're going to choose one person to be in the center. Have you guys ever done the pointing exercise where you point to where the person is? All right, some of you have, some of you haven't. So you're going to have one person that's going to stand in the center, and the other three people are going to walk around outside, away from them, about at least this far, if she's the person in the center, about at least this far away. One person, the person in the center, eyes closed. One person is going to walk up next to that person, not make any noise, and just stand close to them. Now, you're not two feet away. Get within like 12 inches. But turn your head just a little a bit so they can't feel your breath. And once there's someone there, then somebody else in the group is going to clap or say okay or whatever. And then you're going to do all three of those. Revelation. Is there more? Male or female? What's their name? Okay? Now, the nice thing is you're only going to have three options for what's their name. It's going to make it a lot easier. Everybody okay with that? Everybody understand? Okay, so... You're going to have your groups, one person in the center, everybody walks around them, one person comes close. Everybody gets at least two tries in the center. Everybody gets two tries in the center. So everybody gets a try, at least two tries in the center. So go ahead and get in your groups. Just the first four people, and it's easier if they're not family members or best friends. So first, first other three people, just spread out, get into your groups. We need two people up here. How about right there? How about this group right here? How about this group right here? Is anybody left? We have two people right here that still need a group. James, you can join him if you want. Uh, go ahead and get.